Thank you for tuning in to part three in this series on Paul's Gospel. The question that we need to keep in the back of our minds as we go through what Paul has to say about the Gospel that the Lord delivered to him is this. Does Paul's Gospel differ from the Gospel of the Kingdom that Jesus preached? It's a very important question with tremendous implications. So it's important that we consider that as we go through. And I do believe that Paul answers this very, very clearly. Now, what I said in the last video is that we're going through Paul's letter to the Roman believers because it is the most comprehensive presentation of the gospel in the whole Bible. I think that in this day and age, in the church in general, in the Western world particularly, we're only hearing that we need to repent, believe on the Lord Jesus, and then we're set to go to heaven. Our sins are forgiven, and we become a Christian, and we're part of the church. But in Paul's gospel, he presents a far greater picture. It's more expansive, more comprehensive, and it really presents to us the whole purpose of God. And the way in which Paul is doing this in Romans is absolutely genius, obviously inspired by the Spirit of God. But what he's doing is he is taking the Old Testament and he is giving us the interpretation of the Old Testament, making the Old Testament absolutely relevant to us as New Testament believers. So that's the really important point. Now in chapter 1, which we dealt with in the previous video, Paul speaks about the downfall, the spiraling downfall of the human race from the Garden of Eden to the Tower of Babel and how that every kind of wickedness entered into them. And he highlights the fact that they did not glorify God as God, neither were thankful. And so he gives us a very graphic description of the human race and really human history right up to this very day. Now in chapter 2 and 3, which we want to look at in this video, he then speaks about the spiritual implications of our desperate, sinful state. What implications are there? Because there are eternal implications. And while we know that the wages of sin is death, which he speaks about, there's much more to it. And the way in which Paul uh, presents chapter 2 and chapter 3 is quite a remarkable and very skillful way, way of writing. He is a skillful writer, inspired by the Spirit of God. He anticipates questions that we may ask, and then he answers them. Now, you may have read chapters 2 and 3 many times, as I have done, and kind of set aside much of what he says about the law and about the Jews and so on, because you might in your heart be saying, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. I'm a New Testament believer. None of that is really relevant to me. But what I'm putting to you today is let's be challenged in our heart to take very careful note of the questions that Paul asks and the answers that he gives, because they're all relevant to understanding the bigger picture of the gospel that was delivered to Paul, and therefore absolutely relevant to us, even as non-Jews who've come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. So just to refresh our memories, in chapter 1, this is what Paul was saying. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, the whole of humanity, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. So a, a, a graphic description of the depravity of mankind from God's point of view. And notice disobedient to parents is also included in that list of terrible things. And while one might say, well, is that really that bad? Yes, it is, because that forms the very foundation of families. And families form the foundation of communities. And communities are the foundation of the whole country. And the countries form the foundation of the whole of humanity. So it is one of the building blocks and absolutely essential. So if things break down in the home, they, they tend to then break down right throughout society. Paul was very wise in including that in this list of the sins that are very prevalent in the whole of the human race. 
So Paul says that although they knew God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also prove of those who practice them. So people today are calling good evil and evil good. There is a breakdown of what is right and what is wrong. But deep down in the heart of everyone, there is a conscience and people do know when they're absolutely honest with themselves, they know what is right and wrong. They know that punishment is coming, that there is a judgment, but they just, they just cast that aside. And so that's what he's saying. They do these very things and they even take pleasure and approve of those that do these things. This is very prevalent in our world today. So Paul now in chapter 2 starts to ask these searching questions which we need to really carefully consider. He says, So when you, a mere human, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? So we can't make differences between sins and say, that's a terrible sin, but I only tell white lies or I have not really sinned to that same degree. He says, all of us are in the same boat. We have no no foundation, no grounds to judge anyone else. So that's the point that he's making. He says another question, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Now, I know this verse is quite often used to um, speak about evangelism when we're talking to an unsaved person. We should not call them sinners, etc., and rub their, their noses in it but rather tell them about the goodness and the kindness of the Lord. Now, while that may be have merit and, and have some truth to it, that's not really what this verse is about. Having given us the rundown of the depravity of mankind, the question will rise in our hearts, well, why then has God not destroyed everybody, uh, wiped us all out and started again? And so this is what Paul is explaining. He says, God's forbearance, God's long-suffering, God's patience with sin is because of his kindness and know this, that he's actually being patient for us, waiting for all of us to come to repentance. In another place, the scripture says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's really what he's dealing with in this verse. So here are the spiritual and eternal implications that Paul is talking about, whether we're Jews or Gentiles. He says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Now remember, Paul said in chapter 1, he is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, but also to the non-Jew. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So here he's talking about this very fact. The righteousness of God. God is just and he has to punish sin. So if we continue in stubbornness and unrepentant hearts, we will have to face the judgment of God, and God has to exercise his righteousness and his justice and punish sin. So he says, God will repay everyone according to what he has done. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. Everyone, not one will escape. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So he's, he's showing us very clearly that the gospel to the Jew and the gospel to the Gentile is absolutely identical. It's the same gospel. For God does not show favoritism. Although it appears that he's favored the Jews, he's not going to show any favoritism in his judgment. Now, in this passage, Paul doesn't tell us how we will do good. In other words, how we need to repent, receive the Lord Jesus and become saved, be converted and born again. He's not talking about that. He's sketching for us a picture of the final judgment and he's explaining to us the implications of an unrepentant heart. So Paul goes on to say, all who sin apart from the law, that would be non-Jewish people, will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law, Jewish people, will be judged by the law, 
For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Now, that's exactly what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He spoke about the fact that although you claim that you haven't murdered, if you hate your brother, you're like a murderer. And you might claim that you haven't committed adultery, but in your mind you've done it and you're guilty. So Jesus highlighted the fact that keeping the law has to be done from the heart. The outward keeping of the law does not count. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here as well. Indeed, he says, when Gentiles, non-Jews, who do not have the law, they were not at Sinai, they didn't get the law of Moses, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. So he's he's beginning to introduce the fact that there could well be non-Jews who keep the law from their hearts. He doesn't tell us how that happens. That he'll tell us later. But he's just highlighting the fact that the, the judgment of God will be on this basis. Those that were under the law will be judged by the law. Those who did not have the law will nevertheless be judged because they know in their hearts, their conscience will have told them that the things that they were doing are wrong and they will be judged accordingly. But if they, by virtue of a changed heart, keep the law, then even though they're non-Jews, they will be accepted. When will this all take place? And what is Paul talking about? This is what he says. This will take place on the day when God judges everyone's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So that's where we get the title, Paul's Gospel. So his gospel is presenting us with this fact that everyone's secrets will be exposed as, they, as we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and according to his gospel. Now this is why the gospel that Paul is presenting to us is absolutely essential because whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we're under the law or whether we did not have the law, nevertheless, what Paul is presenting to us in the gospel is the template and the basis upon which we will be judged. So it's essential that we apply ourselves to what Paul is teaching and take very careful note. Now, this is similar to what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, for he says, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That comes from the mouth of the judge himself. Now, the, the Pharisees kept the law to the letter. They were absolutely fanatical about the keeping of the law, but Jesus said in their hearts they were not keeping the law. And so he says, unless we can rise above their righteous standard and have our hearts changed, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So these are very serious things that we need to uh, consider prayerfully and carefully before the Lord. Because remember, Paul said, the gospel is the power of God to save us. So we've got to rely now upon the power of God to deliver us from this depravity of humanity that we're part of and be made uh, saints in the presence of the Lord, forgiven and cleansed. And that's really where he's going with all of this. Let me repeat that part of the gospel, Paul tells us, is that the righteousness of God in the gospel is revealed. So this is a very important part of the gospel, that God will judge sin. And unless we can, as sinners, recognize that we are actually heading for eternal damnation, eternal hell, eternal death. Unless we realize that, we will not appreciate the power of the gospel and the goodness of God that he has made this salvation and forgiveness available to us. And therefore, we will not be thankful. So it's, it's imperative that we recognize our sinful estate, recognize the eternal consequences, so that we might then have a deep appreciation for the salvation that God is offering to us. So Paul, being a Jew himself, he fully recognizes and anticipates the fact that Jews are going to come up with an argument. And so he asks this question, what advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? So he's anticipating the fact that 
that having said that even though the Jews have the law, have circumcision and kosher food and all the laws that distinguish them from the other nations, nevertheless, they will be judged by the law and could find themselves being sent to hell. So the question then, obviously, that would arise in the Jews is, what's the point of being a Jew? What's the point of the whole of the Old Testament? What is the point of the covenant made with Abraham and circumcision and all of these things? We've just really wasted our time. So Paul anticipates that question and then he answers it. He says, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. So he's saying, the advantage of being Jewish and the advantage of being part of the nation of Israel is that God gave the wonderful truths, the oracles of God, were entrusted to them. Now we as non-Jewish believers might say, well, that's irrelevant to us. But may I say, it has tremendous relevance and we've got to take note of this question and the answer because the word that was delivered to the nation of Israel and through the nation of Israel, through the prophets and through Moses, has a tremendous amount of relevance. It's all part of the build-up to this glorious, powerful gospel that Paul is presenting to us. He then asks another question. What if some were unfaithful, some of the Jews? So in other words, he's now Paul is referring to the whole of the Old Testament that tells us of how the Jews failed time and time again. So what if some were unfaithful, a Jew may ask. Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? So that's the question and Paul answers it. Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. So even though human beings and particularly the Jewish nation have failed and turned away, turned away from God, he says, nevertheless, God remains true. As it is written, so that you may be proved right, the Lord, when you speak and prevail when you judge. So God has honoured his side of the covenant and remained true to his promises. Remember, part of his promises were that if they disobeyed, then a curse would be upon them. If they obeyed, blessing would be upon them. And God has honoured what he promised. Another question, but if our unrighteousness as Jews brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? So, so now suddenly they turn the tables and Paul anticipates this question being asked by the Jewish people, knowing how argumentative they are and how they think. He says maybe the Jews will then say, oh well, we've actually enhanced the righteousness of God by our disobedience. We've shown up how good and how faithful God is. Paul then answers that question. He says, I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If that was so, how could God judge the world? So in other words, he's saying God's justice, God's righteousness is revealed that he has to judge sin no matter what. So despite the fact that the nation of Israel disobeyed God, nevertheless, God remains true not only to his goodness and the, and the blessing that he promised, but also to the judgment that he has promised. Paul goes on to read the Jewish mind, and he says, Some might even argue, if my falsehood as a Jew enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Paul then answers that with another question. Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, so in other words, there's those that were saying that this is what Paul teaches, and some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. So some had interpreted what Paul was saying, that he was preaching, let us do evil that good may result, to enhance the goodness and the righteousness and the faithfulness of God. He says, if that is the case, if that's what we were preaching, then their condemnation is just. So if that's what we're saying, then they're right in condemning us because actually that's not what we're saying. Another question. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? So that's the big question. Do we as Jews have any advantage? Then he says he's changed the whole thing because of the collapse of the Jews and their disobedience, turning away from God 
They were not glorifying him as God, neither were they thankful throughout all their history through the various kings that they had. He says, in fact, not at all. We potentially could have had great advantage having received the oracles of God and being singled out as the nation that would bring the light and the glory and represent God to the other nations. They failed in that calling. So he says, now, not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. We've all been enslaved by this condemnation of sin. Paul goes on and he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, to the Jewish nation, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So those that were given the law, they are silenced by the law because they've broken it. Those that did not receive the law are nevertheless guilty before God. So the whole world is accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law because it's been broken. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. So whether we are Jews or Gentiles, the law has this purpose to highlight our sinfulness and make us aware of our sin. He goes on, but now apart from the law, so outside of the whole covenant where the law was given by Moses, The righteousness of God has been made known. So in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, to which the law and the prophets testify. So this gospel that Paul is presenting actually comes from the law and the prophets, from the Old Testament. They've all testified of these things. This righteousness, which has been revealed by the gospel, is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. So here it's very clear that there are, we don't have two Gospels, only one Gospel. There is one Gospel to the Jews and the same Gospel to the Gentiles. It is, it is identical. The Law and the Prophets have testified of this. Paul is now interpreting it and he's presenting it to us as the way out. This is the solution to the sin problem. This is the power of the Gospel. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, sin is the word chata in in Hebrew, and what that means is to fail. We've all failed in the original plan that God had and purpose that he had for mankind because we were made in his image and we were meant to represent God and represent who he is and all his characteristics and the fruit of the Spirit. But we have all failed in that. So irrespective of the list of sins that Paul has highlighted in chapter 1, we have all failed because we have not represented God correctly by our character, by our lifestyle, by our attitudes. So we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God, the glory that God intended us to have. But now the gospel will restore that glory. And that's the good news that Paul is presenting to us. So now Paul is presenting us with the solution and revealing the power of the gospel. He says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement to atone for sin through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, not by the keeping of the law, but by faith in what Jesus Christ has accomplished. He did this to demonstrate his justice, God's justice. As we said, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel and his justice has been revealed because in his forbearance or his patience and long suffering, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So right throughout the Old Testament, although there were consequences to their disobedience uh, with the Jewish nation, Nevertheless, God did not punish them because of their sin. He left that. He was patient. He was long-suffering until this present time. He did it to demonstrate his justice at this time. He demonstrated his justice when he poured out his wrath and the punishment upon his son, Jesus Christ, upon the cross. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in 
in Jesus. So God is just because he's punished sin, but he can also justify those who put their faith in Jesus because the price for sin has been paid. What wonderful news and what a powerful message to deliver us from hell, eternal death, from the depravity of sin and degradation into the glory of what God intended for us to bear his image and to bear his glory. So Paul, having presented this very powerful statement about the, the love of God and the justice of God, he now anticipates a series of questions these are important questions for us to consider. He says, where then is boasting? We can't boast about circumcision. We can't boast about keeping the law. We can't boast about doing good. Where is boasting? It is excluded because the only way to be righteous is to receive a free gift by faith. Because of what law? The law that requires works? So is there any way that we can gain this? and boast about it? No, because of the law that requires faith. So he says there is this new way of attaining to the righteousness that God requires, and that is by putting our absolute confidence in the work that Jesus accomplished upon the cross. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Now, does that mean that we discard the law altogether? No, it simply means that we cannot be saved by the law. But having found righteousness and justification, forgiveness, through faith in the Lord Jesus, our hearts are changed. And this is what he then goes on to say. Is God the God of Jews only? Important question. Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? And this is a question that is debated to this very day. There are so many even evangelical and, and Pentecostal and charismatic believers in the church today who make a difference between Jews and Gentiles, even in Christ. So they don't know how to deal with the Jewish nation in the New Testament. But Paul is saying, is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? This is what he answers. Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised, the Jews, by faith, and the uncircumcised, the non-Jews, through that same faith. There is only one gospel, one way to the Father, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we need to get that in our thinking, because that will affect the interpretation that we apply to the whole of the New Testament, and particularly to this book of Romans. So it's vital that we get this clear. So as I was saying in the beginning, these questions, some of them may seem irrelevant until you think about them carefully. And actually the answers are absolutely vital for our understanding of what Paul is really saying and our grasp of the gospel that was committed to Paul. So let me conclude with another vital question that Paul asks. And this is something we need to consider carefully. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? So having come to faith in the Lord Jesus and found forgiveness and we have received a gift of righteousness from the Lord, does that mean I'm not under law, I'm under grace? I nullify the law by my faith. That's the question that he's asking. And that is a vital question because there's so much error that has entered into the thinking of many in the church today um, concerning this question. Here is the answer. Not at all, he says. Rather, we uphold the law. In other words, the Spirit of God has written the law of God, the Ten Commandments, His righteous standard, upon our minds and upon our hearts. And so from our hearts, we now live out this very truth, the standard of righteousness, this high moral standard by His grace. And so that's why in the book of Hebrews, we read that we need to come to the throne of grace boldly, to obtain mercy where we stumble in this area, but then find the grace of God to enable us to live up to the standard. And this is the power of the gospel. It transforms us. If we're not being transformed by the gospel, then the chances are we have not heard the gospel and we've not responded to it because Paul assures us 
that this gospel is powerful enough to transform us out of the depravity that we're in into children of God who represent God, who bear his image and bear his glory. Amen.